All right, today I'm going to be talking about um, adherence assessment and promotion in pediatric oncology and each um, hemopoietic stem cell transplant. Um, I don't have any um, conflicts of interest or financial relationships here to report. And uh, most of the work I uh, will be talking to you about today was funded by the NCI. Um, our objectives are here today are to talk about the factors that influence treatment adherence, um, describe the prevalence of uh, poor adherence and uh, the influence of that poor adherence on health outcomes and consider um, potential methods to integrate adherence care into practice. So I thought I'd start off with um, making sure that we all um, are familiar with um, what childhood leukemia is, because um, I know we have um, a, a diverse group today who's not necessarily all uh, pediatric psychologists. And um, the other reason I'm sharing this is it's one of the fun things I get to do that we've done in the past here at Cincinnati Children's is put together um, some of these educational videos for patients and families, um, which has really been fun to do. And then uh, lastly, I hope perhaps you'll find it helpful, um, you know, if you ever want to use it with a patient or family, they're out there on YouTube. Um, and it just provides a really nice um, explanation of it. It's only about two minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and play that. Our bodies are made up of trillions of tiny little things called cells. That's more than the grains of sand on a small beach. Actually, cells are even smaller than grains of sand. A million cells can be the size of one grain of sand. Not only are cells very tiny, but we also have different types of cells in our bodies. We have cells in our hair, in our skin, and in our blood. Blood cells are made through a special process inside your bones in a soft and spongy material called bone marrow. Bone marrow is like a factory that builds cells. These cells come out as red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets. Each cell has a different job to do. Red blood cells give energy to your body. White blood cells fight off disease and platelets help your body stop bleeding if you get a cut. Some cells don't grow up as expected. These cells are known as cancer cells, and they don't behave like normal cells. In leukemia, the white blood cells, the ones that fight off infection, are the ones that don't grow up and can't do their jobs properly. When they multiply and divide, they do not know when to stop and when to die off and they will destroy good cells close to them. To help you get better, doctors will give you medicines called chemotherapy to get rid of all the unhealthy cells. You can get this medicine through something called a central line or as a pill. The medicine is very strong and can destroy some healthy cells too, which can make you feel tired and weak. You could also lose some of your hair. This is okay though because your bone marrow can always make more healthy cells and your hair will grow back. The important thing is making sure all the unhealthy cells are completely gone so that you can feel better again. Now that you know the basics about leukemia, there are a few important things to remember. Your cancer is not contagious and it's not your fault. Many other kids have leukemia too. Even some of the doctors or nurses who are helping you get better may have had leukemia. Cincinnati Children's is here to answer your questions, so don't be afraid to ask. So there is um, a whole library of those types of videos that we have, a group of us have worked on and made over the years at Cincinnati Children's. Um, and let's see here. So. I know you don't want to hear it again. Here we go. And so it's those oral medications that, those pills, that chemotherapy pills that I want to uh, talk a little bit about next here. Um, 
where they're talking about the central line and you're, you're getting chemotherapy um, into your bloodstream, um, that's called the induction phase. And you get that, the children get that in the hospital. Um, and over time, they move out of that phase um, to a phase where they're just doing oral chemotherapy uh, for somewhere between two and three years. Um, sometimes it's two and a half years to three and a half years for boys and girls. Um, depending on the staging of their particular leukemia. And the reason, um, and that it's this part that we're gonna be talking about self-managing. So I wanna throw out some key terms here. First, um, self-management is what we're talking about when we were discussing that interaction between all the behaviors that you have to do um, to care for a cr chronic condition or any kind of health condition, right? So you have to get the prescription, go to the pharmacy, you got to make sure you know what time and day to take that medication. Um, you need to know whether to take the little yellow pills or the pink pills. And then hopefully the interaction between, in our field, in pediatric psychology, the interaction between the parent giving the child the pill goes like this and not so much like this. Um, this, on the other hand, refers to the degree to which, to which behavior coincides with medical or health, ad, or health advice. So is the patient doing what that prescription has asked the patient to do or what the doctor has written on that prescription. And adherence is what um, we're talking about today or the lack thereof. We can assess adherence in a number of different ways. There's self-report, pill counts, electronic monitors, and blood tests. We'll get into each of these a little bit more in a second. No one best me method is best for all patients. In fact, all of these different measures have pros and cons with regard to measurement. However, the one thing that we do know is that provider uh, perception of adherence is typically inaccurate um, in most instances, unless the adherence is so bad that they start seeing the medical effects of um, the poor adherence. So looking at self-report, asking patients, it's great because it's quick. Um, it takes limit, limited training. Uh, you know, you can teach um, your nurse practitioners or your nurses to do it relatively quickly um, in a way that will elicit um, more accurate responses by the patient and families. Um, and it's free. Um, the cons are that patients and parents typically overreport adherence anywhere, depending on the study that you look at, um, you know, between 10 and 30%, right? On average, 20% of, uh, of they, they overestimate their adherence by about 20%. This isn't because they're always because, although there are instances of, instances of it, but it isn't always because of trying to deceive their providers. It's just pure um, lack of realization that they may have missed some of those medications. The other problem with self-report is it's really hard um, because of that memory issue with families uh, that we would all have. Um, it doesn't really allow for identifying patterns of non-adherence or certain days or times that are difficult for the patient to adhere. There are also pill counts. They're also free and limited training and they're used in clinical trials a lot, in medical clinical trials. Um, so that data can often be available. However, it's subject to the same um, over-reporting of um, the self-report. And um, so it tends to, to overestimate adherence as well. And then electronic monitors. Um, there's a whole slew of electronic monitors that have hit the market, especially in the last 10 years. Um, and you can get anything from a pill bottle uh, to a pill box. Now they're starting to make various Ziplocs that you can use just depending on what you need. Um, and you know, the pros of these are they can provide you um, as long as the patient is using it because it is a proxy, um, really detailed information, day-to-day -day detailed information about when that patient is taking their medications or not. Um, and you can map um, you know, the medication or the monitor to the patient's regimen. 
right? So it fits their lifestyle. The cons are that it can be expensive. Um, you have to, at this point in time, um, have some kind of process by which you're gonna download this data or capture this data. Um, it's not really easily processed. And as I said earlier, it is a proxy. It does not guarantee that the, the patient actually takes that medication. So the prevalence um, of uh, medication or suboptimal uh, medication adherence in pediatric oncology and HCT um, has been well documented and it surprises many. Um, it's right up there and very similar to other chronic illness populations where about 60% of children uh, demonstrate suboptimal adherence and uh, probably, or excuse me, 60% of, 40% of children uh, demonstrate suboptimal adherence and 60% of adolescents and young adults. Um, and it can even be up to 75% in some studies um, demonstrate suboptimal medication adherence. So these medication, this rates of medication adherence are really, really high and it's really common. And it's really, I think, important to articulate this and get this message across to our medical colleagues so that they understand that really non-adherence is more the norm than the exception. Um, and it's just related to the day-to-day self-management that we were talking about early, earlier in the presentation. Um, but it's really important. Think about how many folks are non-adherent, but really missing one dose of 6MP per week can result in a 2.7 times greater likelihood of a relapse for that patient um, over the course of their maintenance therapy. So recently, um, COG um, and uh, published a, a very large study that they've been doing for years and years and years of an intervention that was designed to improve mercaptopurine adherence, that's the chemotherapy, in children with ALL. And they enrolled 302 boys, 142 girls, um, and the, the interventions were either an education intervention where they got videos um, and basically educational videos about six, six mercaptopurine, um, or they got videos plus a text messaging system prompting them to do, the parent to do directly supervised therapy with the child where they would say, okay, go give your medication to your child and make sure they take it. Um, as you can see, this was done at 59 COG institutions across the US and they found there was no significant difference at all between the text messaging group and the education group. And they were certainly powered to find um, those differences in this study. And if you look at the data even more, you find um, that even some of the patients got worse over time, which to me is actually not surprising uh, because adherence tends to decline over time for um, uh, especially adolescents and young adults um, who are on, are on chemotherapy, oral chemotherapy over time. So about 50, 25 to 50% of these kids in this study were remaining at risk for relapse over time. So what next? I mean, that was a huge study done by COG um, and uh, the premier research institution, I would say, for pediatric oncology. Um, so I think some clues can be found in um, a recent study that we're just trying to wrap up now and you get to, to see hot off the press data um, on HCT. So HCT treats a whole group of different diseases. It's not just one disease. Um, they, uh, the, it's a group of cellular-based therapies that really can treat malignancy, immune deficiencies, hematological disorders, bone marrow failures, metabolic diseases, all of these different types of groups of um, issues that may involve um, the bone marrow. 
So just to remind you, um, the stem cell transplant, um, uh, the blood cells and the bone marrow, oops, hold on. Um, the blood cells are produced in the bone marrow where they began as stem cells. So the stem cells are a bunch of cells that are in this portion of the bone or in the hip bone. And they, those cells have the pot potential to become a lot of different cells. And so in stem cell transplant, what they're doing is the first thing that they do is they destroy um, all of those cells to make sure that let's just say, for instance, since we are talking about leukemia, um, that those leukemia cells are killed. But in the same, at the same time they're doing that, they're also ablating healthy stem cells in the system. So what needs to happen is, is that they need to get a stem cell transplant. Um, and the, the patient's left with no immune system. They get an infusion of stem cells from a donor um, in allogeneic transplants. Um, and, excuse me, my computer's acting up. Um, and then with those new cells, they can rebuild their immune system with those donor cells. Now there are other types of, of trans stem cell transplant where um, a patient's own blood will be taken and used um, and treated in a lab and then infused back into the patient. We're not gonna be talking about that today um, for reasons that'll become clear because the medication regimen uh, for those types of transplants are different than the one I'm talking about today. For this one, um, the patients are required to continue to take prophylactic medications uh, that, that are protect their body while their immune system is weaker during this period of time. And their immune system is basically getting back up to speed and working its way back up to speed. So they have to take um, a set of medications themselves. And they're usually antibacterials, antivirals, antifungals, et cetera. And this is the part that we're gonna be talking about today, the adherence to these anti-infective medications. So our study wanted to look at a model comprised of uh, clinically relevant pre and post discharge factors that might predict how um, patients adhered over time um, following transplant, not during the transplant when they're in the hospital and being taken care of by the medical team, but when they have to take on that treatment regimen themselves after they're in their own home. We hypothesize that higher caregiver distress, poorer problem solving and lower self-efficacy, higher child distress, um, lower adaptive skills and regimen factors such as a greater number of medications at discharge that reflects the complexity of the regimen would predict lower adherence over time. We included children under the age of 12 because adolescents and young adults tend to have poor adherence over time. So they're a qualitatively different group of, a developmentally different group of kids to, to study. There's a lot of different factors within the adherence realm to really think about there. Um, so we just looked at kids under 12 years of age. Um, who were prescribed that oral medication regimen after their discharge. Um, they had to have a consistent primary caregiver who's really gonna be responsible for administering or overseeing that treatment regimen. And the caregiver um, had to be English speaking and at least cognitive, had have cognitive functioning um, that was um, high enough to be able to read and understand our questionnaires. So this was ended up being a three site study at Cincinnati Children's CHOP and St. Jude Children's Hospital. Um, we um, gave the, patient, the parents and if the kids were over eight, um, some measures prior to discharge, um, prior to self, starting their self-management regimen, right? So what are they thinking or what are they experiencing before they're having to do all of this on, on their own? And then we followed them up at time points with those same measures at one, three, five, and seven months post-discharge. 
We also gave them one of those electronic monitors I was describing to you earlier um, to assess adherence to the post-discharge regimen for a seven month period. Overall, our sample reflected our population here at CCHMC and the other institutions um, where the average age of the patient was almost six, average caregiver was about 35-ish, mostly male, mostly white, most of the caregivers were female, um, mother, biological mothers, um, pretty, pretty good diversity in terms of the or, uh, spread on the caregiver education and the household income, 55 uh, percent of them had a household income under uh, $60,000 a year. In terms of clinically, I like to always point out that on average, the kids were being discharged with 12 medications, 12 different types of medications. Those aren't doses, those are 12 medications per day. The doses per day that of the one medication that was in the bottle, okay, so for one of the medications, was between, you know, the range was between one and three doses per day, an average of 2.3 per day. Um, the, the main thing we're looking for in terms of outcomes here are infections and GVHD. Um, those are the, and that's why they're taking those different anti-infective uh, medications. And these were the disease groups, pretty, pretty well spread out. Um, most of them had an unrelated donor as well. These are our key measures. Um, they reflect uh, the constructs that were in the hypotheses um, where we're looking at measures of parental distress, um, child distress, social problem solving, um, collective uh, family efficacy, parental efficacy about HCT care, um, uh, electronic pill bottle, and certainly we reviewed the medical record. So let me give you a little view of what the data looks like that we get out of these electronic monitors. So here's an example of some electronic pill bottle data. Here along this axis here, those are the days, and these along this y-axis are the times of day. The, the gray bars here represent weekend days, so you can kind of see them pretty easily on the graph. The blue dots are the doses taken. The red upside down triangles are doses that are missed. And the red bars are days where the patient didn't get any doses at all. So this individual had pretty variable adherence over time. This is also electronic pill bottle data. This is like a psychologist's dream when you get to see this kind of pill bottle data. And this is a very hard level of adherence to achieve. Look, they're almost exactly at nine o'clock every day. They're taking it every single day. This is near perfect adherence. So this is the kind of variability that we're looking at. Um, in, in our particular study, that day-to-day -day adherence. And if you happen to be in on my grant talk earlier today, one of the things that I talked about um, was the importance of the institutional environment. And this analysis here and the fact that I got to this analysis really highlights that because um, I got to this after working with two different statisticians um, and using their collective knowledge to analyze some of this data. Um, and so we ended up on a, looking at the data with dynamic structural equation modeling, which is a time series analysis used to analyze that really time intensive data like ecological momentary assessment data, daily type of data, right? And here we have um, daily adherence, right? So we took the number of doses that they were prescribed that day and calculated a percent adherence each day for each and every patient. Um, and so we're able to look at with this particular analysis is the variability between days and how that, that adherence changes from day to day as opposed to means and 
uh, trends over time or trajectories over time. And so what was interesting is that we found that not efficacy, not locus of control, not number of barriers, which we often target in adherence interventions, but parental anxiety and depression were significantly associated with the percentage of adherence on any given day. So for their anxiety, to, the anxiety score for that day predicted, significantly predicted the percent adherence for that given day, okay? But interestingly, if you look closely, um, anxiety was positively related to adherence, whereas depression was negatively related to adherence, where it, the more anxious you were, the parent, excuse me, the parent was, the more adherent they tended to be. The more depressed they were, the less adherent they tended to be. And it's fun talking to a psychologist because everybody's like, yes, <laughs> you know? I mean, because it really makes sense that li a little bit of heightened anxiety, um, right? Uh, was, was helpful in, in, in doing those, those checking behaviors and all of those other kind of anxiety uh, types of behaviors and worrying really can serve a person well with regard to adherence. Um, and we often see that clinically as well. So what is it? Are we seeing your Stotts in law here in adherence management where there's like this optimal level of anxiety that would be the best kind of um, uh, setting or uh, situation for adherence? Uh, I don't know. I, I think it might, might be a little bit more complicated than that. I really do because, you know, we all know uh, that, you know, our anxiety symptoms include worry and restlessness and feeling on edge, irritability, muscle tension, but that depression includes depressed mood, withdrawal, sadness, weight changes, hopelessness, etc. But then there's all these symptoms that we know apply to both, right? So there's a lot of overlap between uh, these different um, factors. And honestly, I haven't seen in any adherence of literature before where we've been able to tease these apart. Usually those internalizing symptoms really hang together. And if one goes up, the other one, you know, um, and is positively associated with an outcome, the other is positively associated with an outcome. So we're really interested in these uh, findings and, and thinking about them. So Given that it's this complicated, I want us to kind of step back and go back to that, uh, the Vatya, the COG study, intervention study, and think about what's going on in terms of, well, there may be parental anxiety and depression involved, as well as all of these factors that have to happen and happen at the correct time and place to really achieve adherence, right? Then on top of that, when the parents and the families are discharged, they have the rest of life to take care of, right? Shopping, and all the commuting demands of life, finances, the bills may be coming due, they have to work and work at home maybe, they have to take care of the other kids, et cetera. All these competing demands. Of course, it's really gonna be hard um, to keep up with adherence. And so maybe a text messaging intervention um, and education may be not enough to, to give them the support they need to really achieve um, uh, medication adherence, right? So it brings us back to a model that we worked on in the Adherence Center back in 2012. We published this looking at a self-management model that really considers all the different influencers on how well we self-manage and ultimately adhere to um, a medical regimen, right? Whereas I mentioned earlier, age can influence um, how well you adhere, depression, uh, sever severity of the illness, side effects and knowledge. You have family factors. Um, and these listed here are only factors for which there are citations um, in oncology right, um, in a pediatric oncology and or HCT, right? So 
all of these factors have been shown to really have an influence on it. And so therefore um, maybe uh, that we need a little bit more and consider all of these influencers and how they're gonna influence adherence over time and how that adherence is ultimately going to influence the outcome of these kids, right? How can we prevent that 2.7, uh, how can we prevent a 2.7 greater time chance of relapse among our kids with ALL or a 7.9 greater chance of acquiring an infection in our kids who have HCT or who received an HCT? And I think it's by really considering the whole, the whole entire system, the individual family, community and healthcare system together where we have to monitor and intervene on those factors of what's going on and risk factors and barriers that the family and the individual patient are experiencing. And then we also have to get that feedback going with families in terms of their monitoring and intervention of how they're doing their regimen. I can't tell you how many times I've met with a family and given them um, feedback and kind of a readout of that adherence and they were shocked that any of their medication doses had been missed because by all means, it necessarily wasn't intentional. Um, so we can achieve, uh, I think, these better outcomes. We're not there yet and we haven't cracked the code quite yet. Um, we're moving towards this. And I think based on other illness groups, we've, um, and inter adherence promotion interventions and in other illness groups, we're starting to, to make some progress in, in um, hematology, oncology. Um, so kind of considering um, adherence promotion interventions. Um, so overall, we've, we did um, some meta-analyses looking at standalone adherence promotion interventions, whether they were educational, behavioral, technological, um, that, and when I say standalone, I mean they were delivered outside of the patient's health care. And although there was a significant effect size, it was relatively modest. Um, we also did another meta-analysis where we looked at um, adherence promotion interventions that were done within the context of the patient's treatment. Um, and it was either, it was delivered by their health care providers. And although still modest, those tend to do a little bit better. And it's not surprising because, you know, all of these interventions, if somebody's already having a hard time adhering, we're asking them to do something on top of everything else, as opposed to integrating it into their care and really having it um, as something not only we're telling them is important, but they also know that they're their providers are aligned with that, that concept and that they feel like that adherence is important as well. So um, we're st this, this next part is very, um, this is kind of our next steps and where we're going next. And, and we're just taking baby steps really in this direction where we're trying to implement um, adherence interventions um, within our institution um, and in hematology oncology. So I'll tell you a little bit about where we're at with our HCT program. Our goal, of course, <laughs> the holy grail is to um, you know, develop tests and implement something that's spreadable, that has a standardized assessment, and that where those interventions are tailored to meet the barriers of that family and whatever their particular influencers are on their self-management to optimize that self-management and adherence and ultimately their health outcomes. So we've tried to really think about our intervention as a feedback loop as well, um, where we are asking how is the patient taking the medication? What are the barriers to taking that medication? and having discussions around that, and then delivering interventions that are matched to those barriers that the patient is experiencing at that point in time, and based on what is important uh, to the patient that they would like to address in terms of their medication management. So 
we get, we're giving out electronic monitors to our patients. Um, and this sends real time data to an internet portal. Um, the cost of these devices are about 300 bucks uh, plus a $15 a month fee. Um, however, um, when you consider the cost of a relapse, it's really quite nominal. Um, and um, so we're handing these out and we're using that those with quite a bit of confidence because we have looked and we have used these, these um, electronic monitors broadly. Um, we also did a study kind of testing these and putting them at a head to head test for these different monitors within the adherence center. And we found that, you know, the pill boxes do quite well um, in terms of having no extra or missed doses. Um, however, they tend to be a little bit more costly, certainly, than just the pill bottles themselves. And then we, this is where, this is where the labor comes in. This is where it gets tricky because we have designed these calendars and we take the data um, of the times and dates from, from those uh, Excel spreadsheets is, is essentially what we export um, from those websites and put them into something that is a little bit user-friendly for, for the patient and family, where we can give them this information about how many doses they may or may not have missed in a week and the times that they're taking them. And then using this, we can kind of look at patterns um, of their medication taking and when it's hard and when it's easier for them to get in their medications. Um, and this is indeed um, uh, real data from, from one of our um, adolescent and young adult patients that, that we uh, were working with. Um, in terms of our barriers assessment, we have a simple 19 item checklist where it's yes or no that our oncologists have worked with us to modify. Uh, for this population from other versions that, that we've had. And we've gotten those translated so we can use them with a number of different populations um, that come through our doors here at the hospital. And then we have, we have mirrored um, or um, we have married the, the adherence barriers with our potential adherence intervention st uh, strategies, trying to create kind of an algorithm for our providers to use. So we have all of these different handouts and um, this is the, the part we're in right now. So this is all very theoretical in the sense that um, we're having our nurse practitioners hand out these, these uh, different um, informational uh, flyers that uh, patients and families can use. And then if they want more help, certainly, we can get them more help with that. Um, and then for this set of barriers, the patient have a discussion um, and facilitating a discussion between the healthcare provider and the patient, whether that be the nurse practitioner, physician, or and or patient family. Um, those that really kind of call for social work intervention where somebody might be running out of medicine or they can't afford the medicine, certainly we get social work uh, in there and make sure they're alerted to that fact and the need for that family. Um, and then referrals to psychology of, for folks who may uh, have some other barriers like depression, anxiety, ADHD, flat out refusal to take their medications, which does happen. And then organizational and executive functioning difficulties. We pull in neuropsych when it's appropriate. If we need that assistance to understand what the nature of those um, uh, executive functioning issues are. Um, otherwise, we can just do a psychology consult with those. So this provides some guidance to, to our providers on kind of the what do you do with that information once you have it in hand. Um, the other thing we're doing for right now in this um, initial stage is one of our clinical psychologists is kind of making sure this is, this is going as intended and providing kind of that um, uh, in, in the moment teaching and guidance um, with the medical team uh, that it's gonna be using this algorithm or this use the algorithm. Um, here are some of the, the common um, uh, uh, educational tools that we use. Um, 
pill swallowing, you know, making the medicine taste better, take, talking about the medicine, et cetera, that I was mentioning earlier. So these are some of the handouts they used. We have other versions that have pictures on them um, as well. Um, we just kind of leave it up to, um, that has the exact same information. So, um, and folks find, typically find these quite helpful. They're, they're really tricks of the trade that we've really learned from families along the way over the years of working with a lot of families. I think as we're working with our providers, one of the things we wanna emphasize is really it's the approach is so important. So all of this stuff is great in terms of the algorithm and the measurement and et cetera. But I think until we make adherence promotion, a routine part of the care for the patients and families um, and the providers, um, we're only gonna get so far. Um, because when you make it a routine part of care, um, it's not like they're catching you doing something wrong or not doing it well enough. Um, it really facilitates open communication between the providers and staff and patients. I mean, on the... <laughs> It sounds like I'm making this up, but on the first day, we we taught our nurse practitioner to ask um, or assess adherence in a different way, right? Because she had been saying, oh, hey, are you taking your meds? Oh, yeah, 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 right? So we asked her to rephrase that. How many doses of your, you know, let's say back drum have you missed in the last seven days, like since last Friday? And then she, she was amazed that she got, oh, wait wait, no, I think we actually did miss that on Thursday. Um, and then they started talking about why without the whole barriers assessment or anything like that, because the parent automatically went into the story about why that medication dose was missed. And then they were able to have a conversation about that um, medication. That's not always how it happens, but I have seen it happen a few times. Um, I think the, the normalization is really important and also conveying not only to our providers, but also our patients and families is that you never fix adherence, right? It's a process. Everything is changing in everybody's family all the time. You're having to adjust, schedules change, um, right? It's one of those things you just kind of have to continually adapt over time to match what's going on in your life. Um, so you never just kind of arrive with adherence. And that's another reason why it really has to be a part of the care. Um, when you can, you know, if you're, if you're using, um, if you're either studying adherence or uh, treating adherence in a clinical setting, multiple, if, there, if it's possible using multiple measures of adherence to uh, assess it and monitor it over time. Um, if you can effectively use technology, do. If, if, you, if you don't have access to technology or you can't use it well, don't worry. You can still have those conversations and still set a culture um, in that clinical room um, of trust and ability to talk about this um, and that it's important to talk about as a team. Um, and then recognizing and capitalizing on the specific expertise within the team, right? So as you'll notice, we didn't just send and ha have all those barriers addressed by one individual on the team. Um, I think it's really important that we recognize that, you know, some providers may be more effective at having some of those conversations that others, than others. And the important part is getting the right person in the right room as quickly as possible. So we're gonna be testing this eventually. Uh, what we're doing right now is uh, collecting pilot data um, through our um, evidence-based and driven uh, intervention that we're um, administering in clinic. Um, and we're hoping that we'll be able to see some movement over time on that. But that's the next project that's going to be following up home. And I will wrap it up there and say thank you to all my collaborators. I had a great team and none of it happens without them. Any questions? Anna, I have a question for you. I was sure. surprised at how young your average age was in your samples that you were showing. 
So, yeah. and I'm just imagining trying to get a four-year-old to take that many pills in one day. Yeah. Have you looked at any of this variability by the age of the child? Yeah. And uh, interestingly, uh, it did not predict uh, or was not significantly um, associated with adherence in the sample. Um, you know, one thing I should have mentioned is not all of them are on, on pills, right? It's oral medication. Um, some of them are on liquid meds. And so um, that's where some of the, the taste issues really come in and needing to teach folks how to make the, some of those liquid medications taste a little bit better um, over time. And so we worked with our pharmacists to um, figure out what was safe and what we could mix with those medications and not. That, I think I saw your hand up. Uh, hey, Anna, uh, awesome talk and cool work. Uh, thank you uh, for sharing that with us. Uh, your point there about that the nurse asked the question reminded me during my internship, I had a supervisor who asked every patient, we saw them in a team setting, asked every patient, you don't smoke, do you? <laughs> yeah. And you know, he never identified a veteran who smoked. Uh, he had the lowest prevalence of smoking in his clinic of anybody ever. So the way you ask makes a big difference. So one of the very last things you said touched on a thing that was in my mind, it kind of relates to that is I'm, I'm curious how you physicians, nurses, how do they respond to your complicated models of adherence and the culture of adherence? Uh, sometimes our physician colleagues just want to blame the patient and throw up their hands. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. How are they receptive to, to this work and these ideas? Absolutely. Um, so I'll tell you a funny story. So let's see, it was 2013 and I've got my, my R, like my funding and my R1 and I'm all excited and I'm going up to the floor and it's like my first patient that I'm going to like recruit for my, for this home study, right? I'm so excited. I'm like, this is my dream come true. And so <laughs> I go in there and I'm going in, um, I'm in the ante room about to, you know, go down and go see this family uh, to recruit them. And out comes the physician and she looks at me and she's like, oh, I haven't seen you for a while. What are you doing up here? And I said, oh, well, I'm going to go recruit them for the study. And then I was, of course, I was like, blah, 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 my study and telling her all about it. And she's like, oh, that's nice. You're not going to find anything, but that's nice. And I'm like, oh, really? I said, tell me about that. And she's like, um, she's like, these families have invested too much. They've gone through too much. They've gone through hell. They are, they adhere to their medications a hundred percent. They're not going to risk it. And I said, well, that'll be great if I can show that because it'll be one of the first populations, pediatric populations that we've ever observed that in. <laughs> um, unfortunately, yes, or, or fortunately or unfortunately, um, you know, unfor it's, it's the same as other pediatric populations in terms of uh, rates of adherence uh, for the most part, you know, maybe 10% higher here or there. Um, but again, I was looking at the younger population. So the average is a little higher with them anyway. Um, and really over time, I think probably, I don't know why, uh, you know, probably from hearing about it, um, that perception has really changed. And I have fantastic um, providers that are really helping me and enthused and um, excited that, that we're doing this work and just saying, do whatever you want to do, um, which is a dream. I mean, it's really fantastic. So it has really changed. <laughs> yeah, Larry. Uh, Anna, I was just kind of curious about your, your findings about the, that relationship between anxiety symptoms and, and depression, uh, you know, predicting non-adherence. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about your next steps in terms of looking at that relationship? Are you guys gonna try and go back and really hone in on what actually is taking place and how that transaction is occurring between uh, parent anxiety uh, and, and non-adherence or adherence versus depression? Yeah, I mean, um, yes and no. I think, um, you know, I don't have a good answer in terms of honing in on it at this point in time. Um, I really would, um, 
like to do studies where you're in the home and you get to see, you know, um, how that unfolds or get some way of understanding how that unfolds for the family, um, do some kind of observational study in that way. Um, but, you know, people don't want you in their homes, <laughs> you know, I mean, the recruiting for those studies are very, very difficult. Um, and on top of that, uh, you know, this, this group will be particularly, I think, sensitive to that uh, due to the infection risk. Um, so there's that. I think, you know, certainly we could do an observational study, um, you know, um, in vivo and clinics and things like that. But um, I am open to ideas and would love any ideas that you might have on how to tease that apart a little bit better. I also think I, I, I want to replicate it somehow. Uh, <laughs> I don't think NIH is going to give me money to replicate it. Uh, but, um, I, you know, I think it would be good to replicate as well. Maybe for now you just tell parents to go home and be a little anxious, but not too anxious. How's yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's right. Other yeah. questions? Going, going. Yeah, I have one thing. Sure. So uh, I was struck when you talked about the physician who said that these families have gone through so much, there's no way they would not follow through. Yeah. Have you switched them to thinking these families have gone through so much, there's no way they can keep up with all of this? It's a <laughs> right? really interesting perspective. Yeah, no, I mean, um, no, it, it, it's, I don't know if I've switched their perspective. I, I think um, there are, you know, certainly the physicians I'm working with in clinic, I think they get it um, and they realize how much they're asking their patients and families to do. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, how can anybody do it? I don't know. It's amazing that they do as well as they do, honestly. Other questions, thoughts, comments, sage advice you have for us, Anna? Oh, I thought you were going to ask for sage advice for me. I was like, yes. <laughs> I'll take any. <laughs> I think you're doing well on your own. Um, <laughs> well, let me just again share uh, our appreciation for you taking the time uh, to do these, these virtual presentations today. Uh, uh, it, it certainly is a, a, a privilege to have you uh, revisit uh, Oklahoma State University. Uh, you, you are being honored as well. I think you know this by now as a distinguished Pete Psych alumni. Uh, I know that Katie, Katie has your plaque. Oh. We will be sending to you um, uh, here very shortly. So just to kind of sh you know, show our appreciation for all that you've accomplished. So oh, Well, thank you so much. I couldn't have done it without all you. <laughs> That's for sure. All right, everybody. Well, I think that is uh, it for today's colloquium. Uh, everyone be safe and thanks for attending. Really appreciate it.